Welcome everyone, glad you're here. You can uh, find your seats and uh, as you're sitting down, you can turn in your Bibles to 2 Kings 22 and 2 Chronicles 34. Those passages are about the life of King Josiah and uh, we are in the midst of our series called In the Lord's Sight. The series is walking through uh, 1st, 2nd Kings and then 1st and 2nd Chronicles. Uh, we are wrapping up. We have three weeks left in this series. So this will be this week and then three more weeks. Uh, and then we'll be done. And then we're going to start the book of Lamentations. So you can kind of read through Lamentations if you haven't read that to kind of prepare your heart uh, and to look at that. Hopefully you'll learn something from it, like how to lament. We're going to do kind of a very practical, what does it mean to lament? How do you do that? Because um, honestly, up until this point, I hadn't really thought about how lament is done. I know it. I do it. I can read verses in the Bible, Psalms, and see where it's at. But really kind of looking at what it means to truly lament before God as a spiritual discipline. Because almost all the great spiritual leaders that we read about lamented. Uh, and, and there was a process to it. And so we're going to look at that. In the meantime, we're going to be finishing up this series. And remember, in the Lord's sight, it just means at each turn, we'll see it again, Joshua did what, or Josiah did what was right in the Lord's sight. We're going to find that in a minute. His father did what was evil in the Lord's sight. And so you see that, that comment over and over. The kingdom was split. They've been divided. It's now been about 100 years since the northern kingdom has been wiped out. So it's 100 years later. The southern kingdom is a vassal um, of the Assyrian Empire. They're paying taxes. The Assyrian Empire is always after them. It's a mess. And God's people are not really doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, it's pretty sad, actually. Last week, we looked at the life of Manasseh, one of the wickedest kings in the Bible, um, and then his transformation that he built wickedness, and then he repented, and then he set out to change that and to build something different, and that we're never outside of God changing our hearts and bringing us back to him and building something new in our lives. And we looked at that with the life of Manasseh. Uh, this week, the question's going to be, what are you seeking? Okay, what are you seeking? Um, we'll see this morning that Josiah decides that he is going to seek the Lord. Manasseh didn't seek the Lord. Amnon doesn't seek the Lord. And Josiah says, I am going to seek the Lord. Judah is very close itself to going away into captivity. We're going to see in just the next several weeks that Judah ends up being wiped out and the Israelites don't go back to the land until 1947. I mean, that's a long time. Thousands of years. I mean, it's, it's terrible. Um, and God said, why? Because I had to cleanse the land from all the evil that had been done. And so the question for us is, what are you seeking? What would other people say that you seek? If they looked at your life, if you talked to them, what would they say that you seek? What, what consumes your thoughts? Because that normally will tell you what you're seeking, right? Like whatever's consuming you is the thing you're seeking, what consumes your time? Because typically that's often the thing you're seeking. You work because you need money <laughs> so that you can pay bills. Now, some of us work because we love our jobs, right? But for a lot of people, that's not the case. But there's other things they're seeking that require work because that's how the world works. And so what consumes your resources? Because that'll tell you. What testimonies or stories do you find tell, that you're telling others or telling yourself in your head on a regular basis? Because that will tell you what you're seeking. Like it's, it's really not hard to figure out what you're seeking. The problem is we just don't want to figure it out. I'd rather say that I'm seeking certain things and not check on it than actually check and see if I really believe what I say I believe and what I'm seeking. And the Bible is all about, and God himself sending prophets, confronting us with saying, you think you're seeking this, and you're not. And I love you enough to just have the conversation. That's like the whole Bible, right? That's Jesus when he comes. He's like, you all think you're seeking me. You're seeking a Messiah. I'm right here, and everyone ignores him. Everybody's like, yeah, crucify that guy. <laughs> Hello, the whole book's about me. What have you been seeking? 
Well, not you. We're not seeking you. We're seeking the Romans to be overthrown. We're seeking wealth. We're seeking power. We're seeking all kinds of other stuff, but not you. And that's exactly where we find the children of Israel. So let's back up where we were last week. Manasseh dies. His son Ammon comes to power. He was 22 years old when he became king and reigned two years, only two years in Jerusalem. He did what was evil in the Lord's sight, just as his father Manasseh had done. Ammon sacrificed to all the carved images that his father Manasseh had made, and he served them. Obviously, Manasseh didn't destroy those images, unfortunately. It also goes on to say, but he did not humble himself before the Lord like his father Manasseh humbled himself. Instead, Ammon increased his guilt, so his servants conspired against him and put him to death in his own house. Then the common people executed all those who conspired against King Ammon and made his son Josiah king in his place. What a mess the nation is in. I mean, we've had a president assassinated before, and what a mess that was. Like when, when, when leaders get assassinated and then you assassinate the assassins, that's a mess. That shows a culture that is in complete and utter decay. They have no idea how authority works, right? It's just disastrous. And, and that's where we find the children of Israel. Now, something you need to know as we go into this portion of Josiah that's critical to understand. You see, God raises up and tears down kingdoms for his purpose. That's key throughout all the scripture. We think God isn't in charge. He's in charge of raising up and tearing down nations. He's done it over and over and over again. And he normally uses those nations as disciplinary tools, as rods for his children. Because if you spare the rod, you spoil the child. And so often, even in your life, God will use the national law to bring you under control. There are things that you don't do because the law says not to do them. And you would do them if the law didn't say to do it. Speeding's the big one, right? Like we would drive as fast as we could to get wherever we were going if there weren't laws and police officers to slow us down. You don't think so? Let me ask you. When you're driving down the highway and you see a police officer, do you think to yourself, I know I'm not speeding, I'm good. Or do you look at your speedometer immediately? You look at your speedometer, we all do. We check. It's, it, we, what? Ooh. You know, it's, it's that fear, it's that moment. It's exactly... What God does throughout history with nations. And right now, the Assyrian Empire, who God sent Jonah to preach to, and they repented at one point, now they have treated God's people so horribly and so badly that God, through the other prophets of the Old Testament, I'm not going to go into it, tells them that because you've done this, you're going to be wiped out. Assyria is now in a huge mess. Egypt and Babylon have come back to power. Babylon is a new nation on the rise. So it's kind of like America, Russia, and now China's risen up. Okay, that's Egypt, the old Russia, or us is Egypt, either one you want to say. You've got Assyria, which could be us or Russia or whoever. And now you've got these Babylonian Chinese rising up. That's literally what the picture is that you see here. And then you have Judah. So you got these four world powers in this part of the world that are buying for power. And guess what? Not only has Judah's king been assassinated, but King Ashurbanipal dies in Assyria. And the Assyrian nation is in a mess. And so right now, Judah's in a very safe place because Assyria is kind of ignoring Judah because they're like the lowest on the totem pole empire they need to worry about. They're like, we know Judah doesn't have anything to defeat us, but we're scared of Egypt and Babylon, so we're just going to leave them alone, which is exactly kind of what we've done with China in our own day. And now they're rising up, and we're all like, wait a minute, how did they get to be the big dogs on the block? And I'm not saying that one's better or evil. I'm not saying that. I'm just trying to give a picture of kind of how this works in our culture. Nations use one another, but behind the scenes, God is working. And so at this time, God is defeating. He's pushing down the Assyrian Empire. He's going to bring the Babylonians in to punish the Assyrian Empire. The prophets in the Old Testament said that was going to happen. Babylon was going to raise up to squish Assyria for how Assyria treated God's people. And then he looks at Babylon, prophet Jeremiah is the one that tells them this, and says, hey, if you'll be good disciplinarians to my people, I'll give you a great empire. He does for Nebuchadnezzar. And then he takes that away because the Babylonians don't treat his people well. And he raises up another nation. That's Persia, right? It's this continual process that God does to try to get the attention of his people to cry out to him. And thankfully, they get another king, Josiah, that listens. 
He listens. So let's dive in. 2 Kings 22.1 says, Josiah was eight years old when he became king. And he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. So he only lives to be age 39. Remember Manasseh? Manasseh lived to a ripe old age and he was wicked and evil. Josiah only lives to age 39 because he makes a mistake and he dies at 39. Many of you may make a mistake and die at 39. Some of you live past that. Congratulations, a mistake didn't kill you because you made a lot of them and you probably should have been dead multiple times. <laughs> we all have, right? But for some reason, God has allowed you to continue. And so Josiah, his mother's name was Yedidiah, the daughter of Adadiah. She's the first Jedi. See that? Just, I'm kidding. That's not true. Okay. I had to say that joke. Come on. It's right there. The first time I saw her name, I'm like, she's a Jedi. Like, that's awesome. It's not true. Okay. Then he says, she was from Bozkath. He did what was right in the Lord's sight. There's that term we've been looking at all the way through and walked in all the ways of his ancestor, David, going all the way back to when God gave them the ways they were supposed to walk in the land with a king. So he says, I'm going to go all the way back and really look at how did the best king lead that we know of. And then he says he did not turn to the right or to the left. This is critical. You know, it, it's keeping your eyes focused. He's like, I'm not I'm focused on the Lord. I'm focused on his people. I'm focused on what he wants. Okay? Um, his mom's name means beloved of Yahweh. So here's this woman whose name means beloved of Yahweh who raises a son who sees and believes that people need to know that they're beloved of Yahweh. But they don't know because they're undisciplined. And so Josiah is going to help them. Second Chronicles 34.3 goes on to say, In the eighth year of his reign, while he was still a youth, Josiah, look at this, began to seek the God of his ancestor, David. So he actually tells us when this happened. This is the eighth year of his reign. How old is he? 16. Most 16-year-olds, that's not the point in which they turn to God. It's the point they turn away from the Lord. Josiah turns to the Lord. And he spends the next four years seeking the Lord, cleaning his heart out before he ever does anything else in the nation. He is trying his darndest to say, how do I seek God? And we're going to see in a minute, this was really hard for him because there was something he didn't have to do it with. And Josiah's like, I've got to figure this out. I'm 16 years old. The nation is a mess. Like, there's wars going on all around. The, the Assyrian king is dead. This new empire is rising up. He's trying to figure out what people have said. He's trying to figure out what's true. And that's where we find Josiah, four years seeking. So how did he seek? Because it says he began to seek God. Some of you have only been Christians four years. You've only begun to seek God. Some of you said you were Christians like I did. I said I would have said I was a Christian from the time I was five, seven years old, all the way until I was 18, until I realized I haven't been seeking God at all. I've been seeking me, not God, not his people. And so at 18, it, a, a change happened for me that I began seeking God for the first time. Well, after four years of seeking, here's where we find ourselves. And in the 12th year, he began to cleanse Judah and Jerusalem of the high places and the Asherah poles, and the carved images, and the cast images. So first, Josiah spends four years seeing the idolatry in his own heart, in his own family, seeing the righteousness of David, probably had the writings of Samuel, First and Second Samuel, and the writings of David, and how he lived as a king. He had those. He was probably reading those, looking over those, and he's like, you know what? They didn't have these things. We're not supposed to have these things. So he begins tearing those out of Judah and Jerusalem. He starts where he's at. First, he starts with his heart. He works there four years. Then he starts with Judah and Jerusalem, the place around him. And then he's going to go outside beyond there. This is a great lesson for us of how to do ministry. So many people, it becomes about going and doing something big for God. It's like, no, live your life here and allow him to take you out. Allow him to send you. It goes on and it says, then in his presence, the altars of the Baals were torn down. He chopped down the incense altars that were above them. He shattered the Asherah poles and carved images and the cast images, crushed them to dust and scattered them over the graves of those who had sacrificed to them. I mean, this is bold. This is causing some problem. This, you're, you're picking fights with ancestors. 
My ancestors worshipped. Remember, they've been doing idolatry for a long time in Judah. And you're, you're messing with grandpa's Asherah pole. Remember grandma's Asherah pole we read about earlier with the kings? Like, you went in and took down grandma's Asherah pole? Nobody does that. Yep, I did. I crushed it to powder and I dumped it on grandpa's grave. That's what's going on right now. I mean, this is bold. And then it says, he burned the bones of the priests on their altars, so he cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. He's like, this is ridiculous what we've done. We, we cannot continue this way. I mean, he spends this 12th year, like he, he goes from this 12th year at age 20 is when he starts this, age 20, and begins to tear these things down. And you know, it's amazing to me because he's going to tear all this down and they're just going to rebuild it right back up. And that's what we do in our lives. We tear down the idols, we get rid of the stuff, and then we build it back up. People come into our lives, things come into our lives, and we put the idols right back in place every time. And it's the continual process that you see through Scripture over and over and over again. And it shows us what we're really seeking because idolatry tells us what we really want, what we're really seeking. It just does. It always does. And we've got to stop putting our name on God's idols, right? We keep putting our name on things. Remember, Jeroboam built two idols in Dan and Bethel. He made golden calves and he called the golden calves Yahweh one and Yahweh two. <laughs> he didn't worship another God. He just made God into something he wasn't. The high places all over the northern and southern empire, most of those high places weren't to a different God. They were high places to Yahweh God that God never asked them to build. He said to go to Jerusalem. He gave them an, a calendar outline of how you were to go to Jerusalem and come back and how you were to do life. Watch the moon. It'll tell you exactly when to go and what to do. That's what he told them. And they've been continuing in the name of love and tolerance over and over again to try to just keep their skins and to keep Assyria happy and to keep the Northern Kingdom happy and to keep everybody happy. They just continue to go along with the idolatry. And now Josiah is like, I can't do this anymore. I, I, I had a grandfather who was so wicked and, and at least he turned to God in his last days, praise the Lord. And a father that got murdered because of the wickedness. I'm not doing this. If I'm going to die, it's going to be for the right reasons, Josiah is probably thinking in his mind. Not for the wrong ones. Which is beautiful if you think about it. Then look what happens. He takes care of Judah and Jerusalem. Now he starts picking a fight with Assyria. Because it says he did the same in the cities of Manasseh, Ephraim, and Simeon, as far as Naphtali and on their surrounding mountain shrines. He tore down the altars. He smashed the Asherah poles and carved images to powder. He chopped down all the incense altars throughout the, the land of Israel and returned to Jerusalem. He went to the northern empire and spent six years. This was a six-year idolatry campaign. Six years of him going through and saying, no, no. And guess what? Probably as he started moving forward, the other people were like, let's just take care of it before he gets here, right? Dad's coming home. We got to get things cleaned up. Mom and dad are going to be home at 3.30 and we made a mess. We got to get it cleaned up. They're coming in the door, right? That, that, that's likely what was happening. But anywhere he went, he's like tearing this stuff. He's crushing it publicly like, this is not going to be a part of our kingdom anymore. He went into the northern empire, which was under Assyrian rule, but the Assyrians weren't in any position to fight him, so fine. I'll make it right. I mean, this is bold. This is so bold. Then it says, in the 18th year of his reign, in order to cleanse the land and the temple, Josiah sent Shaphan, son of Azaliah, along with Masaiah, Masaiah, the governor of the city and the court historian, Joah, son of Jehoaz, to repair the temple of the Lord, his God. He's like, you know what? I've taken care of what I've seen. I've gone all around. I, we, we've got to get ourselves right before God. I, we, we've got to cleanse the land of this mess and this disaster. 
So they went to Hilkiah, the high priest, and gave him the money brought into God's temple. The Levites and the doorkeepers had collected money from Manasseh, Ephraim, and from the entire remnant of Israel, and from all Judah, Benjamin, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So not only was he going around destroying their altars, he was saying, oh, and by the way, you need to give money so that I can do the right worship. <laughs> so you've been doing it wrong, I'm destroying it, now pay me so I can go do it right so you don't get destroyed. This is bold. And then it goes on and it says, they put, into the hands of, they put it into the hands of those doing the work, those who oversaw the Lord's temple. They gave it to the workmen who were working in the Lord's temple to repair and restore the temple. You know, the temple today is our hearts, to repair and restore our hearts before God, to put in the work, to invest in the restoration of our hearts. There's an investment that's got to be made, and it's costly. Costly in time and costly in money if you're going to do things differently. It always is. Always is. There's no shortcuts. And then it goes on. It says, they gave to the workmen who were working in the Lord's temple to repair and restore the temple. They gave it to the carpenters and the builders also... And also used it to buy quarried stone and timbers for joining and making beams. The beams of the temple had been caved in. They didn't, the people didn't care. They didn't care what had happened to God's people and his worship. It's like, well, I can't do anything about that. This is so sad, but praise God they're doing something about it. They gave it to the carpenters. They gave it for joining. And then it says for the buildings that Judah's kings had destroyed. Read that again. Not the Assyrians had destroyed. Not the Egyptians had destroyed. The people that were supposed to be leading God's people had destroyed it. Purposefully. For other reasons and other intentions. Like, that's serious calling them out. Like you've done that. You kings, because you wouldn't stand up for the truth. Here's what's happening. And then look what it says. It says the men were doing the work with integrity. These were men that were like waiting just for the opportunity to use their gifts, their abilities, their skills to glorify God so that the people could worship him. And they didn't have to keep track of them. Well, maybe they're stealing money. They're like, no, we want to do this. We want to give our lives to this. We want to be sure that people are able to worship. This hasn't ever been done. No one has gone into the northern kingdom like this and destroyed and gone after Jeroboam's sin. We're all in. Great thing to find out if you're seeking is do you work with integrity or do you work with some other for some other benefit? If you're seeking God, you will work with integrity because you know you have a God that's watching in his sight and not for any other benefit. And whatever other benefits you get, you're grateful for. And you should be grateful and rejoice for those benefits. You get a paycheck, you get health insurance, praise God. But why are you doing it? Because God says to work six days and rest one. It's a good thing. And we live in a culture that lets us rest too a lot of times. Praise God. He goes on, Paul even said that there are many people doing God's work without integrity for earthly profit, and these guys weren't doing that. He goes on, their overseers were Jahath, Obadiah, the Levites from the Meritites, or Merites, and Zechariah and Meshalem from the Kohathites and supervisors. The Levites were all skilled with musical instruments. Do you know how much discipline it takes to play a musical instrument? The reason these guys are skilled and they work with integrity and they can oversee with integrity is because they know how to do hard things because they've learned how to do hard things. Because to play a musical instrument means you've got to work hard to figure it out. It just doesn't come natural. You just don't pick it up and like, woo, that's very rare. And even the ones that are naturals, they develop their natural skill. They just don't say, oh, I'm a natural. They, they love it. They're passionate about it. You know, it, it's amazing to me. Like, I, I, when I read this verse, the per first person I thought of was Jason. Jason is one of the most gifted overseers that, that I've ever worked with in a church. In all the years of ministry, incredibly gifted overseer, an incredibly talented musician. I have some musical ability. I can play and do music. 
That doesn't mean you have to be. It's just one of those things that those kinds of disciplines, like playing an instrument or playing a sport at a high level, like those are things that prove what you're seeking. It shows that you've sought something that was hard and you worked through it and got to a proficiency. That's the point of this. So they were also over the porters and were supervising all those doing the work task by task. Some of the Levites were secretaries, officers, and gatekeepers. Boy, those are really important jobs. Secretaries, officers, and gatekeepers. Those poor saps didn't get really important Levite priest jobs. Have you ever been the guy that's used to a secretary and then your secretary takes a couple of weeks vacation? You ever been that guy before? I have. Boy, howdy. You're like, whatever it takes to keep you, I will cut my own salary. Like, whatever it takes. Doorkeepers? You don't think gatekeepers and doorkeepers are important until the wrong people come in. Then all of a sudden, it's like, we need gatekeepers. We need door- more police. More police. We wanted to defund them. We got to refund them. Hurry, quick. Like, this is what we do in our culture. I mean, these guys were content to do these simple jobs because they were doing it because they knew finally we get to seek the Lord. There's a king who will allow us to seek the Lord without killing us because Manasseh killed everyone that sought the Lord. Then it goes on. When they brought out the money that had been deposited in the Lord's temple, Hilkiah the priest found the book of the law of the Lord written by the hand of Moses. Consequently, Hilkiah told Shaphan, the court secretary, I found the book of the law in the Lord's temple, and he gave the book to Shaphan. Read that again. Josiah had been doing all these reforms without the Bible, or with only small portions of it. He had never read the first five books of the Old Testament. That's the law. He didn't know about Abraham, or if he did, it was just, you know, there's this guy Abraham we're descended from, blah, blah, blah. Never read the first five books of the Old Testament. Didn't know the law. Was doing the best he could with the information he had from like maybe Samuel, 2 Samuel, some Psalms David wrote, the hodgepodge stuff. Can I just tell you, that's the modern church today. People hodgepodge in their spiritual theology, hodgepodge in their stuff together, and they've never read the stinking book. People going to seminary, taking seminary classes, never required to read the book. True story. Happened in our church. Take an Old Testament class, not required to read the Old Testament. But here's all the authors we want you to read and the excerpts that we want you to read that back up our theological narrative. Read the book. Josiah is making all these reforms. He's doing the best he can because he's never had anyone tell him there's a book. (laughs) Tell him he should read this. Tell him to know this. I mean, it's amazing what Josiah has gotten done to this point. It, this shows that he really is seeking God. And God is incredible grace. Is like, you know what, Josiah? I am so pleased with you. I am so happy with you. I'm going to let you find my word. I'm so happy with you. For what you've done, I'm going to let you find my word. And it's going to just blow your mind, Josiah. And it does. It's amazing. Do a, do a study sometime. I'm not going to go into it on, on the word, right? If you do a study on the word, just go to like this website, Open Bible Info, type in the, the word of God and just read all the verses about the word of God. And Josiah didn't have it and he was still doing the best he could. But we're going to see what happens when God, when Josiah seeking the best he could finds the best to seek God with. It's crazy what happens. And you got to remember, you think this is different for us? The Catholic Church wouldn't even allow people to read the Bible in their own language for a thousand years. Think about that, folks. For a thousand years, the Bible was written in Latin that people couldn't read. William Tyndale tried to translate the Bible into a known language for the people and they burned him at the stake. You think this is just a problem in the Old Testament? Bad spiritual leaders don't want you to know this book. 
because you'll challenge them and they don't want to be challenged. Good spiritual leaders know you need to know this book because they need to be challenged. Josiah goes on. It's amazing what happens. Shaphan took the book to the king and also reported, your servants are doing all that was placed in their hands. They have emptied out the money that was found in the Lord's temple. They're not hoarding anymore. They're like, why aren't we using this in the kingdom? Why are we just keeping money? Like, we got to use this. And then he says, look at this. And have put it into the hands of the overseers and the hands of those doing the work. Then Shaphan, the court secretary, told the king, Hilkiah, the priest, gave me a book. He doesn't even know it's the law. He calls it a book. I got this book. I don't, we didn't have time to read it, but uh, we found it. It must have been pretty important. So we thought we'd bring it to you. And Shaphan read from it in the presence of the king. It doesn't say he read the whole book. It says he read from it. So he's like, he's like, yeah, there's this part here. And then there's this part here. And like, we're trying to read over it, but there's a lot here, right? Watch Josiah's response. When the king heard the words of the law, he tore his clothes. King's clothes were really expensive. And in those days, you didn't just go out to Walmart and buy some clothes. You didn't just order them on Amazon and have them delivered. They were actually woven by people. It had to be brought in by the sheep, woven. Dye was expensive. Like you did not rip King's clothes. For him to rip his clothes, right? Probably wool, so not easy to rip. <laughs> like to do this was a declaration of like, I have not been seeking God like I should have been. Josiah, <laughs> you, you haven't been seeking God? What you've done? And no one went into the Northern Empire and did what you did. Yeah, I'm, I'm not even close. I, I don't even measure up now that I've read this. I, I, am, I am undone. And he rips his clothes, which is a sign to the nation that you should be shredded in your heart. Your heart should be ripped open for what I just found out today. It goes on, Acts says it this way, when Paul, or when Peter is preaching his first sermon, this is the response of the people when Peter preached. It says, therefore, let all the house of Israel know with certainty that God has made this Jesus, this Yahweh says, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah, He's Lord and Messiah. Let me just say that again. There's a lot of people running around loving the fact that Jesus is their Messiah. They don't want him to be their Lord. He is Lord. He gets to say he's in control. He is Lord and Messiah, not just your Messiah. And if you think he's one or the other, and there are people running around thinking he's just Lord and you got to work for the Lord and he's not your Messiah, that's just as evil. You are not saved by works. You are saved by grace, by the guy who is the Lord and Messiah of grace. And then you work like Josiah is getting ready to do. And look at what the people's response was to Peter. When they heard this, they came under deep conviction and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what must we do? Repent, Peter said to them. Repent just means to turn from the way you're going, all that stuff, and turn to him. He goes on and says, repent and be baptized. Each of you in the name of Jesus Christ, that is Yahweh who saves, who is the Messiah. That's what his name means. For the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all the children after that, for all who are far off, as many as the Lord will call. And with many other words, Peter testified strongly and urged them saying, be saved from this corrupt generation. So those who accepted his message were baptized. To be saved, it doesn't say to be loved and accepted by this current generation. It says to be saved from the corruption of it. We're so busy trying to get everybody to love and accept us. Like, no, it's a wicked generation. It always has been. Like we, oh, until Jesus comes back, you live in a wicked generation. I, I hope you know that. Like it's not going to get better till he comes back and brings a whole new world. Your generation might be a little less wicked than the last one, but you're still wicked. We all are. 
And he looks, and I love this, and used to, baptism used to mean something. When you were baptized, it was literally a declaration of you walked out of the city and walked out into the river or wherever it was and publicly declared, I am now going under the water and coming back. Death and resurrection, I'm a new person. And if people would, wouldn't even ask you if you were a Christian in these days to persecute you. They would just ask you, have you been baptized? And you have a choice to make, lie or tell the truth. Yes, I've been baptized, off with his head. Baptism used to mean that for a long time. Today, people get baptized five and six times, and it means almost nothing. And it's so sad to me, because it used to be the mark, and it still is in some places, the mark of I'm a, I am a changed person. I used to be Josiah who didn't know how to seek God. Now I am coming to seek God. I used to just be a Jew and Abraham. Now I understand who the Messiah is. I am transformed. If you haven't been baptized, why not? Be baptized. Make a public declaration. Baptism was a public declaration that said, I am following God. It was publicly declaring that. You can hold me accountable because I'm following the Lord now. That's what baptism meant. 2 Corinthians, Paul says this, For even if I grieved you with my letter, remember, Josiah is very grieved. He's brokenhearted. He's grieved by the word of God, not excited by it. He reads it and he's ripping his clothes, not like, man, I'm so good. I'm more righteous than all the kings before me. I've done so good. No, he's like, I'm, I'm toast. I did not regret it, even though I did regret it, since I saw that the letter grieved you, yet only for a little while. Paul says, now I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because your grief led to repentance. For you were grieved as God willed so that you didn't experience any loss from us. For godly grief produces a repentance not to be regretted and leading to salvation, but worldly grief produces death. For consider how much diligence this very thing, this grieving as God wills, has produced in you. What a desire to clear yourselves. What indignation, what fear, what deep longing, what zeal, what justice. In every way you showed yourselves to be pure in this matter. You ready for this? Look at Josiah and what he does. Josiah does exactly what Paul says. When you decide to seek God and your life has changed, here's what it'll look like. And he lists all these things. What fear, what deep longing, what indignation. Watch what happens with Josiah. Then he commanded Hilkiah, Achim son of Shaphan, Abdon son of Micah, Shaphan the court secretary, and the king's servant, Aziah, go. Go, ask Yahweh for me and for those remaining in Israel and Judah concerning the words of the book that was found. For God is the God, or for great is the Lord's wrath that is poured out on us because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord in order to do everything written in the book. Josiah gets it. Josiah's like, we're in trouble. We, we, are, we are so in trouble. We, we, are, we are headed for a disaster. I had no idea how bad it was. I knew it was bad. I spent six years trying to get rid of bad. Oh, it's way worse than the six years that I went and got rid of stuff. It goes way deeper than I ever thought Josiah is looking at. And he looks, and this isn't, he looks at them, he says, you've got to tell people that God's wrath is coming. This is the message. That's what Peter told them in his first sermon in Acts. That's what Paul said in Corinthians. God's wrath is coming on what you're doing. Stop it. It's a beautiful picture of God's love and his mercy and his discipline as a good father. First John says this. This is how we know that we love God's children. When we love God and obey his commands. For this is what love for God is, to keep his commands. Now his commands are not a burden because whatever has been born of God conquers the world. This is the victory that's conquered the world, our faith. And who is the one who conquers the world but the one who believes that Yahweh who saves is the son of Yahweh? Like, this is the New Testament. And John is still saying the commands are good. <laughs> not ignore them, not they're not important. Just bury that Old Testament. We just focus on the New Testament. Nope, you better know what's there because you're not gonna be able to make sense out of the New Testament if you don't understand why it was in the Old Testament. And that's what Josiah has now figured out. Like, okay, I'm doing some good things, but I didn't realize how bad it was till I started pulling the layers. John also wrote this in his gospel. Jesus said this. John said, this is what Jesus said to him. If you love me, you will keep my commands. 
And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. He is the spirit of truth. What did Josiah do when he heard the word of the law? He immediately went out and he said, you guys have to find counselors. Find people who actually have read the word of the law, or they heard it when it was read a long time ago. Because it was probably read under Hezekiah, which was about 75 years earlier. Are there any old people that can help us? Are there any old people that can help us understand this? Today, we're like, are there any old people we can put in the home and get them out of our way so that we can get what we want? You got a pastor that's old? Get rid of him. Move him on. Got to get that guy out of there. Got to get the young guy in. It depends. Is he senile or is he still following God? Pastors feel old and they just want to leave. And I'm like, why don't you raise up some young guys and disciple and coach them? You'll do a terrible job. We all do. But you still got to do it. He goes on. And again, this is the most controversial statement. Did God really say is the most controversial statement of history. What did God really say? And this is it. What, what really are his commands? What did God really say? Pick back up 2 Chronicles. It says, so Hilkiah and those the king had designed or designated went to the prophetess Huldah, the wife of Shalom, son of Tokath, son of Hasra, keeper of the wardrobe. What wardrobe? The one Josiah just ripped in two. <laughs> like, like, you just ripped my, what I did in two in front of everyone, right? She lived in Jerusalem in the second district, and they spoke with her about this. Do you want to know why they had to go so far, and they finally found this woman, Hulda, probably an older woman? Manasseh had killed all the prophets, Jewish history tells us that Manasseh sawed Isaiah with a saw in half. There were no men left leading, and the men that were left were weak and had kept their mouth shut, which is why they weren't dead. So the only person left they could find that would speak up is Huldah. This is the same person like Deborah, right? When you read the Old Testament, Deborah didn't want to be a leader. She looked at the men and she says, you guys should be doing this. And because you're so weak, a woman's going to get credit for this today. And everybody thought, oh yeah, Deborah. Deborah's going to get the credit. We love Deborah. Not me. It's going to be jail. It's just going to be some wife that sticks a tin peg through the head of the king of Sisera. She's going to get all the credit. And Deborah, I'm going to write a song about her. It, it's amazing to me. Like, when it, Look, Luke says it this way. Woe to you. You build monuments to the prophets and your fathers killed them. We will talk about Moses, we'll talk about the Old Testament, we'll talk about how great the Word of God is, and then as soon as it starts to convict us, we kill it. Kill that word. I don't want to hear it. Isaiah says this, youth, youth suppress my people and women rule them over them. My people, your leaders mislead you. They confuse the direction of your paths. Isaiah is prophesying your culture is so disastrous that the leaders don't lead anymore, and the people that are leading shouldn't be leading. Now, does this mean that women don't have a place, that only men can lead? No. It just reveals what we're seeking. Do we want young people to lead us because they're cool and slick and we think they're going to know things? Do we, like, what is the reason for it? I mean, Proverbs says this. When you look at the Proverbs 31 woman, she's not a woman that doesn't do anything. She's in, oh, go back, sorry. She's in business. She's in real estate. She's known publicly. This is not a woman that's like at home and nobody knows her. This is a woman that's out serving, but she allows her husband and her sons to be elevated when you read Proverbs 31. This is a woman that knows the best thing to do in culture is to be sure that men are called to lead. And if they won't lead, well then it, we have to, but I'm gonna keep calling them out. Now, how do I know this is Holda's heart? Glad you asked, because look at her answer. She said to them, this is what Yahweh, the God of Israel, says. She doesn't say, says to me. She says, this is what he says from the book that you asked me about. They came to her and said, what does the book say? And Hold is like, well, let me tell you what the book says. Say to the men who sent you to me. This is what Yahweh says. I'm about to bring disaster on this place and its inhabitants, fulfilling all the curses written in the book of the law. They're all written there. Deuteronomy's full of, if you don't do this, this is going to happen. It's all laid out. And then look what it says. And then he says, 
written that they read in the presence of the king of Judah because they have abandoned me and burnt incense to other gods in order to provoke me with all the works of their hands. My wrath will be poured out on this place and it will not be quenched. I don't know about you, but most of the authors that I see out there today don't answer this way. They answer, you are beloved, you're cared, God loves, it's so wonderful, everything's going to work out, God has your best interest in mind, you are precious. Those things are true. They were true in this day. And Holt is like, you ask me to tell you what the word says, you're in trouble. We're all in trouble. It's coming down and we're, it's not going to be quenched. God is going to, his wrath is on us. And I've been watching it, making wardrobe after wardrobe after wardrobe for wicked king after wicked king, just wondering when is it all going to crash? Man, that is a bold statement. And it's unfortunate that most of the women in the Christian world today don't speak this way. That most women in the lost world will speak this way more than Christian women. They'll, be, they'll tell you about climate change. Boy, and they will protest and they will lay their life on the line for climate change. And women, like, they'll, they'll strap themselves to poles for the pets, you know, and PETA. They'll do all that. Where, where are the Christian women that will step up and be like, we're all cursed because of you guys? We're in trouble. That's Holda. She's an amazing woman. Amazing woman. And then it says, say this to the king of Judah who sent you to ask Yahweh. This is what Yahweh, the God of Israel, says. Why? Because this is what God said about kings in the Old Testament. She's not making up some words she heard. She's just reading. She's quoting from the book. She says, as for the words that you heard because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before God when you heard his word against this place and against its inhabitants and because you humbled yourself before me and you tore your clothes and wept before me, I myself have heard. That's what God said in Deuteronomy that he would do. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and seek God. Like he said this all the way through the scriptures. And then he says, look at this. And you tore your clothes and wept before me. He was looking at him. God isn't off in a distance. He's watching every moment. He's going, I saw all that, Josiah. I saw every bit. I saw deep in your heart. I saw the passion you had. And then he says, look at this. I will indeed gather you to your fathers. You will be gathered in your grave in peace. Your eyes will not see the disaster that I'm bringing on this place and on its inhabitants. Then they reported to the king. Remember, this is what was said to Hezekiah. And Hezekiah didn't necessarily do the best job in getting the people prepared, right? He didn't go further out. Josiah, when he hears this, he goes further. He doesn't say, I just want it for me. And actually, Josiah does not die in peace. He dies in war, by the way. So this peace that he's talking about, he's like, Josiah, you're going to die in war, but your people will be at peace. Because the curse for the nation was before this, so the peace is the peace of the nation when you die, is what he tells him. So the king sent messengers and gathered all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. The king went up to the Lord's temple with all the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, as well as the priests and the Levites and all the people from great to small. Everybody, get here. He read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant that had been found in the Lord's temple. Pause. How long do you think that takes? Okay, let me tell you. If the average reader reads at a speed of 300 words per minute, and you can speak that out loud, which probably you can. It's probably slower, except for crazy people like me. Okay? If you can, if you can speak probably around 200, 300 words a minute, just to read the law, the first five books of the Old Testament, okay, just to read it out loud in one sitting, get through it all, would take six hours and 32 minutes. Six hours and 32 minutes to eight hours. The entire city of Bloomington's gathered together. Everybody's here. All the priests, everybody, and you're here for seven hours. You can't leave. King's watching. We're reading this. You're going to hear this. You've not heard this. You're staying till we're done. Boy, talk about a hostage situation. You know what I mean? And then it goes on and he says, then the king stood at his post. He stood the entire time it was read. Seven hours standing. Then it says, he stood at his post 
and made a covenant in the Lord's presence to follow the Lord and keep his commands, his decrees and his statutes with all his heart, with all his soul in order to carry out the words of the covenant written in this book. Why did he decide to do that? Because the book told him to do it. Deuteronomy says to seek the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Jesus repeats it. Goes on, it says, he had all those present in Jerusalem and Benjamin agree to it. Yeah, you couldn't leave until you agreed. You talk about like eight verses of just as I am till we have the altar call. That's nothing compared to this, right? Like we're just gonna keep singing until somebody comes up and makes a decision. Somebody's gotta come up. We're gonna keep singing. Somebody's convicted. I mean, I was in churches like that. This is, we're gonna make a covenant. You're gonna do this. So all the inhabitants of Jerusalem carried out the covenant of God and the God of their ancestors. That is crazy. Josiah leads an incredible revival just by reading the word of God. Then it says, look at this. Jesus said it this way. This is why Josiah did it. He was obeying Jesus. When they were asked, teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? Jesus said to them, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets depend on these two commands. Every other law, every other law and prophet depends on these two commands. So any law in the Bible, listen, any command in the Bible that is given, Old Testament, New Testament, doesn't matter. The command is there to say this. Are you ready? That command is about loving God and loving people. That command's 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 about loving God. That's what they're there for. They're there so that we know how to love God and love one another. And it's hard. I get it. Because our hearts don't want to love. Our hearts don't want to be under the authority of God. But you have to decide who you will seek. Josiah's like, you guys got to decide who you're going to seek. Jesus is like, you've got to decide who you're going to seek and who you're going to follow. Every law and prophetic word was given so that we could know how to love well. Both in truth and in grace. Look at what happens. Josiah removed everything that was detestable from all the lands belonging to the Israelites. And he required all those who were present in Israel to serve the Lord their God. He required it. Like, I don't care if you don't like it. You're doing it. Like, like we're going to do this. And then it says... Throughout his reign, they did not turn aside from following Yahweh, the God of their ancestors. Why? Because he's not going to let anybody turn aside. We're, we're, we're here. Romans, Paul says it this way. Therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. That's your covenant. That's your covenant act before God. Holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual worship. Worship isn't what we sing. That's a part of it. Worship is your heart posture before God of saying, you're Lord, I'm not. I tear my clothes, I tear my heart, you're in charge, I'm not. That's what worship is. That's what Paul repeats in the New Testament in Romans. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Do you obey out of love? Is obedience out of love or is disobedience out of gain? Because a lot of times we disobey because there's something we want. There's a gain that we're getting. And a lot of times we don't obey in love because there's some kind of gain we want. I love that God lays out so clearly. And Paul says the same thing. Like, I want you to be able to discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will. How to seek God. And when Josiah heard the word of God, even though he was doing pretty well seeking the Lord, when he saw the word, when he got it all, when he went through it all, he realized, oh my goodness, I've got to die. We've got to die. We, we've got to surrender more. I didn't even realize how bad it was. And then there's great joy in that. Then the king commanded Hilkah, the high priest, and the priests of the second rank, and the doorkeepers to bring out the Lord's temple, all the articles made for Baal, Asherah, and the whole heavenly host. He burned them outside Jerusalem in the fields of the Kidron, carried their ashes to Bethel. He did away with the idolatrous priests the kings of Judah had appointed and burned incense on the high places in the cities of Judah and in the areas surrounding Jerusalem. They had burned incense to Baal and to the sun, moon, constellations, and the whole heavenly host. He brought out the Asherah pole from the Lord's temple to the Kidron Valley outside Jerusalem. He burned it at the Kidron Valley, beat it to dust, and threw, uh, threw its dust on the graves of the common people. He also tore down the house of the male cult prostitutes that were in the Lord's temple, in which the women were weaving tapestries for Asher. 
That's how bad they had gotten. They were practicing for worship homosexuality in the temple to Asherah and Baal. These tapestries probably were like lingerie, see-through tapestries that you would wear and that the the, the temple prostitutes would wear to, to attract one another. Today, we got Christians running around that that's how Christian marriage is supposed to be. And that's just garbage. Is it wrong to look good? Is it wrong to be attractive? In the, no, but that's not the point. The point is worship. It's, it's, it's what Proverbs 31 says, that a woman surrendered to God. That's true beauty. Then Josiah brought all the priests from the cities of Judah, defiled the high places from Geba to Beersheba, where the priest had burned incense. He tore down the high places of the gates at the entrance of the gates of Joshua, the governor of the city, on the left at the city gate. I love how detailed the Bible is. Like, this happened. Here's all the details. Then the priests of the high places, however, did not come up to the altar of the Lord in Jerusalem. Instead, they ate unleavened bread with their fellow priests. They kept their distance. Why? Maybe because they were unclean. Maybe because... They didn't want to get too close. We don't know. There was a distance there. He defiled Topeth, which is in the valley of Hinnon, so that no one could make his son or daughter pass through the fire of Molech. Again, they were doing child sacrifice in Jerusalem. He did away with the horses that the king of Judah had dedicated to the sun. They had been at the entrance of the Lord's temple in the, pre in the precincts by the chamber of uh, Nathan Melech, the court official, and he burned up the chariots of the sun. Why would Josiah get rid of their military equipment? Oh, that's right, because Deuteronomy 17, 16 says, However, the king must not acquire many horses for himself or send the people back to Egypt to acquire many horses. For the Lord has told you, you are not to go back that way again. They weren't supposed to have chariots and horses. Josiah read it and he's like, well, then I got to kill the horses and burn the chariots. <laughs> that's pretty simple. I'm not supposed to have them. Well, how are you going to protect yourself? I don't know, but I'm not supposed to have these. He even tore down the altar at Bethel and the high place that Jeroboam, son of Nebat, who caused Israel to sin, had made. No king had done this throughout the entire history of Israel. It was the sins of Jeroboam, the sins of Jeroboam, the sins of Jeroboam. They continued in the sins of Jeroboam. And Josiah's like, I understand the sins of Jeroboam now because I've read the word. I'm tearing it down. No more. And then it says, he burned the high place, crushed it to dust, and burned the Asherah. What did Moses do with the golden calf? He burned it, crushed it to find powder and made them drink it. Josiah's like, yeah, I read that story. I, I read that, so that's what I'm going to do. Because that's, that's what Moses did. He's a good guy, righteous dude. I'm, I'm going to do that. As, jo as Josiah turned, he saw the tombs there on the mountain. He sent some, someone to take the bones out of the tombs. He burned them on the altar. He defiled it according to the word of the Lord proclaimed by the man of God who proclaimed these things. We read this earlier in our series. There was a prophet that said this was going to happen in Bethel. This exact scenario was going to happen. A king would come and would crush all the idolatry. It's also a prophecy for Jesus. But this is just a temporary fulfillment of that prophecy until Jesus crushes and destroys everything. And he says, Then Josiah said, What is this monument I see? The men of the city told him, The tomb of the man of God who came from Judah and proclaimed these things that you have done on the altar at Bethel. So Josiah said, let him rest. Don't let anyone disturb his bones. So they left his bones undisturbed with the bones of the prophet who came from Samaria. Why would Josiah leave the bones undisturbed? Because he read the Bible and he said, there's a resurrection. So I don't want to disturb bones if there's going to be a resurrection, but I want to disturb the bones of people who shouldn't be resurrected. He's just reading the Bible. Goes on, Josiah says this. First Kings is where you can find the story about that prophet, by the way. It's about the prophet that came and prophesied that Bethel was going to be destroyed. It's in First Kings 13.31. You can read it. It's an amazing story. And again, that prophet didn't have it go well for him in the end. Josiah also removed all the shrines of the high places that were in the cities of Samaria, which the kings of Israel had made to provoke the Lord. Josiah did the same things to them that he had done at Bethel. He slaughtered on the altars all the priests of the high places who were there, and he burned human bones on the altar then he returned to Jerusalem. Again, Romans says, Therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, 
pleasing to God. This is your spiritual worship. I don't want you to do anything. I, I'm not doing anything to anyone else that I don't ask you to do. God didn't burn those foreign prophets and priests. He didn't burn them on the altar without asking us to put ourselves on the altar too. And he put himself on the altar of his cross. Do not be conformed to this age. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind so you may discern what is good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Josiah is doing that. Look at what the, listen, look at what Josiah had, had read to him. Josiah had read, he must not acquire many wives for himself. This is about the king that they shouldn't have in Deuteronomy. So that his heart won't go astray. He must not acquire very large amounts of silver and gold for himself. For when he is seated on his royal throne, he is to write a copy of this instruction for himself on a scroll in the presence of the Levitical priest. It's to remain with him and he is to read from it all the days of his life so that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to observe all the words of the instruction and do these statutes. Then his heart will not be exalted above his countrymen. He will not turn from this command to the right or to the left. And he and his sons will continue ruling many years over Israel. Isn't it interesting that God uses the phrase about Josiah, Josiah did not turn to the right or to the left. Why? Because he did this. He obeyed Deuteronomy. That's why. He, he did what God said to do. Second Chronicles says, Josiah removed everything that was detestable. We read this a minute ago. From all the lands belonging to the Israelites, he required all who were present in Israel to serve the Lord their God. And throughout his reign, he did not turn aside from following and seeking Yahweh, the God of their ancestors. He did not turn. We are going after this book. I have it now. I have the record. I'm reading it. This is what we're doing. If you don't like it, then show me where it's not here. That, that's, that's Josiah. So the question for us this morning is, what are you seeking? What is the evidence of what you're seeking? Most people are seeking earthly comfort and peace, and we will do anything to keep it and give it to others, even if it means we perish eternally. Most parents are more concerned about their kids' security and safety than they are about their eternal destiny. If you aren't breaking, ripping your clothes for your children and grandchildren, you need to start doing it. You need to cry out to God. If you're like, well, at least they got a good job and you know they're safe and they're not safe. The wrath of God is on them. And man, that should break you. It should break all of us. Because they don't, if they're not following Christ, maybe they made a decision for Christ. Well, even if they made a decision for Christ, well, they may be saved eternally, but the wrath of God is still on them. Like that's a scary thing. Holda was willing to say it. Where are the moms and dads that'll say it and, cry, and call others to cry out? Cry out for my children with me. Cry out together. There are some of you I have cried with, I have wept with crying out. I'm still praying for your brothers and your sisters and your moms and your dads. It is constant. And it breaks me. There are some days when I'm just like depressed and Susan's like, what's wrong with you? And I'm like, I, I'm just, I don't know. I'm just overwhelmed by the mess. It's hard, but you know what's great? Stories like this, <laughs> stories like Manasseh, <laughs> that he saves. Matthew, as we finish, says this, for the idolaters eagerly seek all these things. And your heavenly father knows that you need things. You need grain, you need crops, you need food, you need shelter, you need all these things. But Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. Seek first to know what his kingdom is going to be like. Do you know the book of Revelation? That's where you're going to spend eternity. Most people don't even know it. And if they do know it, they just know enough about it to argue, not celebrate how great it's going to be. It's supposed to be a, work, a book of incredible confidence and joy, and we make it into a drudgery. It's supposed to be the book that's like, this is my eternal home. That I know what's going to happen. I don't have to be afraid. Yes, I'm seeking that God. Yes, I'm going to do what's right. I don't care what the cost is. I, I got the story. It's right here. And it's not just here. You go back to Daniel. You go back to Ezekiel. It's been repeated. Like we have the answer. So the question for us is, man, God knows all the things you want. He knows what's going on in your life. He knows all of that. He's just looking for the Josiahs that will say, you know what? I'm eight years old. I'm 16 years old. I'm going after what God wants and allow him to lead my life. And however it falls, it falls. Man, that, that's, ah, that's Josiah. It's such a beautiful picture. 
And he proved that he was seeking him because you could just see one thing after another thing after another thing where he literally was just obeying the word of God. God said to do this, we're going to do this. God said to do this, we're going to do this. Just, just obey. And so many of us, we're fighting with God and then wondering why it's so hard. Don't fight with him. Surrender. Seek him. And you know what? You know what's the best part? God is super patient. <laughs> You're going to mess up. It's going to be hard. You're going to go back and forth. And praise God for stories like Manasseh that's like 30 years of evil. And God's like, it's okay. I'm still going to love you and save you. <laughs> Man, that gives us hope. It gives you hope. It gives me hope. But it doesn't give us an excuse to avoid God's wrath. Because Hulda, who obviously was righteous, knew the wrath was coming and she was going to suffer with everybody else. And she knew she had to warn because it was the truth. Let's pray. Father, thank you this morning for your word. Lord, I thank you that you show us what we're seeking. You don't hide that from us. You love us. You care for us. You're patient with us. You're good to us. Lord, I just think about the fact that Josiah, for seven hours, he was so excited about God's word. He spent seven hours requiring the people hear it and read it and then to do it. God, what a leader. What, what a heart that's been changed. What a man that, that understood what it meant to be a man after your own heart like his ancestor, David. Lord, I pray for us in this room. None of us here are perfect. We're gonna find out next week. Josiah messes up. And as a result of that, it costs him his life. But he's with you. You celebrate him. You've written down that he didn't turn from the right or the left his whole life. Even though he made a mistake and it cost him, it didn't matter. He sought you. And we can take confidence in that. God, that is so good for our souls. So Lord, I pray that if anyone here is struggling through what it means to seek you, I pray they would really look at this story. Look back over Paul's words. Look back over your words and these scriptures that we looked at of what it means to surrender our lives. I pray I would see that. I pray I would have a heart for you in that way, that I would be seeking you more than anything else. And as a result of that, I pray that we'd see that it also means that we seek the best for your people. That's what seeking you means. It means seeking the best for your people every single time. Because if we love you, and if we love people, as 1 John says, then we'll obey your commands. Lord, I just am grateful. And if anyone here hasn't made that decision, Lord, to turn to you like Peter talked about, to repent, to stop going the direction they were going and turn to you and be baptized, I pray today would be the day. They'd say, I'm done. I'm finished. I surrender. I become a living sacrifice. I place myself on the altar like Josiah did for four years to figure this out, to surrender to you because you are the Lord and Messiah. And for those of us who know you, Lord, I pray we take great confidence in these stories. We take great confidence in the finished work that you did on the cross, that they looked forward to a Messiah, and we look backwards to a Messiah that came, and Josiah and us together are looking forward to the day when you will be Messiah on a new earth with a new Jerusalem forever cleansed. In your name, amen.